Hello students, Michael Sanchez here. Hope you guys are having a good afternoon, good Friday. Uh, so yeah, uh, this week has been awesome. Uh, although my grandpa just left for Florida, it's sort of a sad thing, but um, sort of picking up as far as uh, just things that are really great. Next week, we're actually going on vacation and me and my wife are um, gonna be going to Chicago, I think, so that's gonna be exciting. Um, so yeah, this class, I'm gonna be giving you guys some tips based on actual questions you guys asked in the Adult Violin Learning Group. And uh, for anybody that comments on that post that's over at the Adult Violin Group, we'll have a chance to win a Leandro Violin Bow. So I'm gonna be giving away this uh, free uh, Leandro Violin Bow. This is the second one I'm gonna be giving away. And all you have to do is comment on the post over at the Adult Violin Group and uh, you have a chance to win. So good luck to you guys. You'll see a bunch of comments over there of people that are hoping to win. And uh, today I'm gonna actually be answering people's questions. So um, what I was thinking is for um, today's technique class, by the way, I'm gonna be giving away the bow at the end. Um, I actually organized all the comments. So like the more beginner questions are sort of at the top and then <clears throat> more of the advanced questions are sort of towards the bottom. So if you're more of a beginner right now, um, this might be more helpful knowledge. Uh, if you're more advanced, you might want to just grab a little coffee and come back. Um, but it's going to sort of get gradually harder. So um, let's just get right into it. So let's start with the very first uh, question. So I have, uh, let's see how many questions I have. Uh, I have over 10 questions from people, so this should be good or more. All right, so uh, Denisa actually asked, how, uh, how can I uh, see your techniques? I'm a beginner, so I need to know a lot of information. So, uh, Denisa, basically, um, I have so many resources on the web. Uh, if you go to youtube.com slash violin tutor pro, I have over 900 videos on how to play the violin. I also have a beginner playlist that basically, uh, it's like 200 videos that are all things that are really good for the beginner level, how to play the violin, how to do all the basics. So I highly recommend checking that out. Also, my website at violintutorpro.com has a ton of resources you can also check out. Uh, Denise, you also said, how do you tell when you have enough rosin on your bow? So basically that is just um, making sure that, first of all, your bow is tightened, which is done here at the screw. And if you just take your finger and sort of just swipe at the very bottom of the bow hairs, it's going to tell you how much rosin is on your bow by how much rosin is on your finger. If your finger is totally white, like it's just white, then you have way too much rosin on your bow. And then what you want to do is sort of take the back of your finger, back of the bow here, and just sort of flick, and you're going to see this poof of rosin. And when you're doing that, you're taking some rosin off. So, so if you have like a totally white finger after that test, then you might want to take some rosin off. Now, if you do this and there's nothing on your finger, then I would recommend, um, you know, putting more rosin on your bow. Some people like are just really delicate with how they put rosin on. They don't really dig into the the rosin block. The other thing that you should do is sort of scratch the rosin first so that sort of the powder comes up to the top and that's going to help you to be able to get more rosin out of the bow hairs. And ultimately rosin, if you don't have rosin on your bow, you're going to get a really wispy sound. Your bow hairs are not going to grab the strings properly. Now if it's right in between, if you have, you know, um, not totally white on your finger or obviously not nothing, it's just in between, that's exactly what you want. All right, uh, next, uh, next question is from Villa. Um, Villa said, how, how can I control my bow from squeaking while playing? So yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's all related basically, Villa, to um, how the bow is in your hands and how you're moving it across. So if you're grabbing the bow too tight, what you're gonna find is that it's gonna have a really tense um, feel to it and it's gonna basically just sort of do more of this, that, instead of... So by grabbing too tight, that can easily happen. If my fingers are really stiff, if my thumb is really stiff, if I'm using too much arm, those are all things that can cause bow squeaks, uh, bow bounces, uh, just things that you don't want to happen. So um, anytime you guys get those sort of sounds, always sort of relate it to you know your technique, and there's always ways to improve your technique. So. Uh, I could go, I could do an entire class on that. So, but those are just sort of some hints maybe that um, you might want to consider. Next question is from Tamika. And by the way, guys, um, I'm sort of getting progressively harder through this class. So like the questions that were posted um, towards more in the beginner level, I'm answering those right now. Later, there'll be some more advanced questions. 
And by the way, I will be giving away a violin bow, a Leandro violin bow to one person that commented on my adult violin learning page. So you actually, if you guys are watching this right now, you still have a chance to uh, enter to win the Leandro bow. All you have to do is visit the adult violin learning group. Uh, some of you guys that are watching, maybe you can post a link to help people. Or maybe you don't want to help people because you want to win, <laughs> have a higher chance to win. Um, but it's basically facebook.com slash groups slash adult violin learners. And we'll be announcing that in the very end of the class today. So I'm going to try to go about half hour, 45 minutes at the most. So, All right, uh, so Tamika asked, and I am beginning to experience bow bouncing. I'm also having a problem keeping my bow parallel. So yeah, Tamika, basically uh, a lot of that has to do with how you're extending the arm out. So if you're using too much shoulder, um, you're, see how my bow sort of starts to go crooked as I use too much arm? So it's really important that as you're playing the violin that you have a, a tendency more to extend the forearm out. So we're trying to do this more instead of this. See how much shoulder I'm using? So try to work on that. And as you're coming back, the wrist should bend. Like that. Okay? So very good question. And uh, by the way, any guys that are asking questions right now, uh, I'll try to cover some of them at the very end. Right now I'm actually covering questions that have already been asked on the Adult Violin Learning page. So uh, it's an encouragement for you guys next time to, to post on, the, um, on the, uh, uh, the time that I asked for your questions. All right, next we have a question from uh, Fran. She says, would like to know how I can improve on mostly down bowing on a sustained note. It sounds very wimpy, weak, awful, happy face. <laughs> So Fran, um, you know, a lot of uh, getting a strong sound on the violin has to do with how you're using the index finger. So if I'm only sort of bowing and my fingers are not really doing anything, naturally I sort of have to use my arm or something, my forearm, something has to be sort of put into the bow to give it volume, to give it more of a loudness or softness. So the way that I can play really loud like this, So I used very similar bow there, but I was getting, I got a much softer sound the second time. And the reason for that is, is that I'm using my index finger, I'm using the front of my hand to press into the, bow, into the bow. And basically what that does is it creates more volume because now the bow is sort of attacking the strings more. So actually a really good drill is exactly what I'm showing you guys right here, is what I call the index drills where you press down into the stroke, sorry, into the bow. See right now how I'm doing that? Notice that the bow hairs are not rocking as I'm doing this. I'm just attacking the stick, making it come down to the hair. See that? This is a really good drill and really good practice of, um, you know, eventually getting more of a powerful sound. So if, yeah, Fran, you said you're sort of getting a weak sound. Uh, that could easily be because you're not using enough index pressure. Now, what also happens as you're pressing down is you're also wanting to use the index to sort of bump the bow I call it. So when you're at the tip, when you're here, you sort of have to sort of bump the bow as well. So the way that I explain it is that this is what the index finger is doing as you're bowing. It's doing both, sort of like, sort of like a conductor, right? So it's pressing down as you're pulling, pressing down as you're pushing. So if you're able to do that, then you're going to be able to get that volume and that good transition. So maybe if you guys can uh, see my finger as I'm bowing, Sort of notice how it's active, it's moving. If I didn't do that, I'd be more. So a good analogy I give people is, um, you know, if you ever have done a yo-yo, you have to sort of have this flow going with your finger, with your wrist, to kind of get it to come back and forth. It's the same concept with the bow. There's a sort of flow. And all that is done by usage of the index finger. So, hope that helps. Now, all right, next question um, from Daniel uh, McKeon. He says, "I'd like some tips on loosening up, loosening up, specifically on the down bow. About mid bow is usually where it gets shaky for me." Cool. So yeah. So you're basically saying, Daniel, that you're going um, down bow, and then sort of as you get towards the tip. 
it starts to get sort of shaky. So the reason for that is, most likely, <laughs> I've seen you know so many people play and I've given so many tips, you probably are experiencing a sense of having to grab the bow harder as it's going away from you, okay? So just think about it, like if something goes away from you, it's easy to sort of want to make sure it doesn't fall, you gotta sort of grab it, make sure it doesn't you know get away. You might be doing that, Daniel, you might be sort of grabbing harder as you're going towards the tip. Anytime you grab harder, that causes bow bounce because now the bow has tension. So what I encourage you to do is as you're going down bow, try to focus on not changing your bow hold, keeping it relaxed, the thumb and the pinky curved, okay? And ultimately, when you're at the tip, the bow is still supported just as much by the instrument, right? Just because the bow is farther away from your hand, from you doesn't mean that... Somebody's hanging out back there. <laughs> just because the bow is farther away from your hand doesn't mean that you should grab harder, right? So this is probably what you're doing potentially. You're starting off relaxed, but maybe you're tensing up as you get towards the tip. All right, so um, yeah, just to give you guys an update, some of you guys are just coming in a little bit late. I'm going to be giving away a Leandro violin bow to one lucky student who posts on our adult violin learning page. Hello. <laughs> That's my wife back there. Um, and uh, all you have to do is comment, and I'm going to pick a random person from those comments today. They're going to win a $250 bow. Uh, right now I'm actually answering questions from people that posted yesterday, and I have about uh, 10 more questions or so we're going to go through, and we're progressively getting harder as we go here. So. All right, so the next question I have is from, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, N.G. Nguyen. Uh, how do I better control my index forefinger on the bow? Good question. So, you know, what I just talked to you guys a lot about is that index finger and how it's important to actually move it and use it. So maybe it sounds like Nguyen, you're having a little bit of trouble controlling that and how you're using it. One tip I give you guys is try to make sure that your finger is not like here. Try to make sure it's a little bit more over the stick. Okay, so a lot of times what I'll tell students is to sort of just have their finger about here and then just sort of let the fingers fall over, sort of flop. Okay, see how they're curved? They're not straight. Okay, so if you can just sort of aim to get your forefinger about here, that's going to help. And then try to make sure your thumb is curved and keep the index there as much as you can. So maybe as you're going down bow, and this sort of relates to what your problem is, Daniel, Maybe the forefinger is sort of slipping away from you. It's starting here, but now it's sort of getting away. It's starting to get more here. So, All right, next question we have from Paul. Uh, Paul says, can you recommend some techniques for using the fourth finger? I find it easier to use the open string instead of using the fourth finger. Yeah, so Paul, this is very common. People like to use the uh, open string um, instead of using the four. So instead of doing... You like to go maybe like that. As you can see, it doesn't sound as good, and I can't technically do a vibrato with open. So um, my biggest recommendation for you guys out there is if you're struggling with the fourth finger, try to focus on finger angles as being the biggest thing, okay? A lot of people, what they do to reach the four is they force the four, and what it does is it causes hand tension which makes it hard to do vibrato, makes it hard to shift. So believe it or not, the, the move that you should do to get a better fourth finger, believe it or not, is actually this, ready? That. So you guys might be here more, trying to play notes here. Now if you're here, now I can actually reach farther because of the finger angle, okay? So try to make that move. Um, if you guys have never played in flats, uh, it's, you're going to be sort of forced to do what I'm doing right here because there's actually a note below the normal one first finger, which is here, okay? Okay, but if you're here more, kind of trying to find notes, you see how it's just really awkward to find that low one? Your whole hand has to move. So being in this position is not just good for the four, it's really good for the low one. So now I just have to squeeze back the finger and I'm still in position to reach the four. So a really good drill would be, uh, Paul, is to play a B flat on the A string, low one, and also play a four right after that. So go like this. Okay, obviously that sounds horrible, right? 
Um, the ultimate practice to do this would be to play a first finger on the E string and then play a fourth finger on the G string and don't move the one. Okay, if you can do that, that means you have good hand position, okay, like this. Don't move the one. Okay, so right now my first finger is down and my fourth finger is down at the same time. But a lot of you guys probably, when you're going for that four on the G string, you're probably sort of cheating a little bit, like you're, you're coming up for the hand for a second coming back. That's a really bad habit because it causes you to have more hand tension, makes it hard to do vibrato. A lot of things can happen wrong when you have um, sort of the, call it the, um, <laughs> the, the second reach, sort of the, you know, as I need to reach. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, let's go on to the next question uh, from Van. Uh, Van says, is there a piece for beginners that teaches several techniques on which is uh, how to build a good foundation? like left hand range, right arm bowing, etc. Yeah, so Van, um, anything that is considered an etude book is going to be really helpful for a lot of things like playing, um, you know, different combinations of notes, uh, finding, um, you know, diff different things that are challenging, like different rhythms that are challenging. Um, ultimately, even, yeah, just with bowings, uh, etudes have really good bowing exercises. Um, my recommendation for etude books would be uh, Wolf Art, uh, Mazas, uh, Kreitzer, that would be more advanced. But if you're more starting out, Wolfhard is really good. Mazas is sort of intermediate. Uh, Sit is really good. I actually have a resource on my, um, on my Violin Tutor Pro website that has links to all these books. So if you guys are interested in getting that, uh, you can email me at michael at superiorviolins.com and I'd be happy to send you that link to those Etude books. All right, next we have... Uh, I'd call this maybe our intermediate um, transition. So now we're going to get into more intermediate tips and questions. And for all you guys watching, um, feel free to uh, go over to also our adult violin learning page. As anybody that comments on our most recent post is going to have a chance at this very end of this class to win a free Leandro bow worth $250. My biggest reason for giving away the bow is just uh, being really thankful and just I really appreciate you guys out there that uh, really support me and um, our loyal fans and followers. Uh, we just had a really great sale and just um, you know I'm really excited just you know that uh, I'm able to teach violin you know for a living and you know um, be able to also provide my expertise with instruments different things like that. So I really appreciate you guys. So this is sort of why I'm giving away. Um, this is the second bow I'm giving away. So good luck. All right, so now we're sort of in the second uh, second section here. Um, so Michelle uh, Michelle's question was, um, I need help with vibrato. How do I start? So if some of you guys are sort of interested in um, starting to learn vibrato, um, the biggest thing is just understanding that you don't want to learn vibrato until you have a really really good foundation in your left hand. Okay. So many students that have even been playing for, say, 10 years, they say, oh, I've been playing for 10 years, I should obviously know vibrato. That's actually a really bad scenario if you have bad left hand technique. So everything I talked to you guys earlier about having the angles back, did you guys remember earlier I mentioned that it can really hurt vibrato when we have bad angles? So instead of being here, or I'm sorry, instead of being here, you guys are maybe used to being here. So. You know, actually, I've seen students that have been playing only three months that are, you know, ready for vibrato because they really have a good left hand foundation. The other thing that's really important, which will be exposed with the thing I told you guys, with the one and the four, is making sure that the hand is high. Okay, a lot of students, when they play, their hand is way down here. Technically, they can't reach the G4. I would not want that student to learn vibrato. Um, I really never have to mention vibrato, like, now it's time to learn vibrato because um, students always sort of at some point want to learn it. It's more me telling them, yeah, you should really focus on this before we do it. Because the worst thing that can happen is bad left hand position, which is naturally going to force the hand to be tense. And to be able to have good vibrato, we have to have the hand flexible. We can't let it like be doing all these crazy things uh, that maybe you don't have for Mary Had a Little Lamb, but you're going to have for more advanced stuff. So we have to be able to just 
place fingers down with no effort in the hand, which is all just having that good left hand technique. Once we're there, then you guys can learn vibrato. And, and I actually have a really good uh, two video series on how to learn it. It teaches you guys exactly what to do as far as how to approach it, how to work on it. I'd love to send you guys that as well. Uh, you can email me at michael at superiorviolins.com. I'd love to send you those videos. All right, next we have a question from Linda Hudson. Linda says, I've noticed that you have a preference of arm vibrato over wrist vibrato. I was taught many years ago that arm vibrato is for those who play the viola and wrist vibrato is for violinists. Also, have you ever observed finger vibrato? If so, what is your opinion on it? So Linda, yeah, this is, I have a, um, yeah, sort of a few things there. Um, really preference of vibrato as far as between wrist and arm is definitely, you know, there's really good players that are more of a wrist vibrato and there's really good players that are more of a forearm. I do forearm vibrato, I prefer that. But what every violin teacher would say, and, re and definitely re not recommend, is a finger vibrato. So we should not be just moving the fingers to be able to vibrato. We definitely want to be doing it from the wrist or from the forearm. And the analogy that I give people, so if you guys were to play mini golf, maybe most of you guys have played mini golf at some point. So it makes a lot of sense to grab the club here and not way down here to putt, right? The reason why this is easier is because it allows a very simple motion to give you consistency, okay? If I'm way down here, it's just gonna be easier to sort of do it a little bit different each time. And the key to getting a good vibrato is consistency, okay? So, you know, it doesn't sound good if my vibrato is it's much better when it's when it's consistent. So I like to uh, give that analogy, but some of the most uh, talented and best violinists in the world do more of the wrist vibrato, but they would do it consistently. So I just think it's easier to learn uh, vibrato consistently uh, with forearm, but definitely don't do finger vibrato. <laughs> That's sort of the cheating way and maybe easier for some. I find a lot of guitar players tend to want to do that. They tend to want to do finger vibrato because I think it's uh, sort of like that with guitar. They sort of have to grab the string and bring it back. That's totally different than violin. Violin is all about this way, not this way for vibrato. All right, our next question is from Paul. Uh, how do I start learning the third position? Would you suggest any drills? So yeah, Paul, um, Third position typically can be learned um, any time, you know, when you sort of have a good grasp of first position. Again, it really comes down to good hand position. So if your hand is way down here and you don't have good concept of finger angles, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to all of a sudden start learning how to shift, which is moving into third position, right? Um, I've had some students that have been playing six months that, like, I say, yeah, we're ready for third position because They've learned uh, most of the key signatures, um, which you should be able to play in the key of G, D, A, C, and then two flat key signatures, I'd say, B flat major and F major. So if you guys are able to play those sort of basic key signatures, which is like two flats up to three sharps, then potentially you're ready, but then is your left hand ready as well? So if you have those things we talked about, then I think we're ready to, to move up and learn some third position. Uh, a really good book for third position that I teach my students is Introduction to the Positions, Volume 1, by Hen Henry Whistler. This book has um, exercises similar to this. like that. So sort of just teaching you guys the basics of learning third position. Now what's really important with third position is making sure that the thumb and the index finger are lined up. So we don't want the thumb to sort of be in random places. We want it to be consistent in how it moves up and how it moves down. Okay and I always tell students to line it up with the first finger intonation. Okay. 
So yeah, a lot of students grip, grab the fingerboard too hard, their thumb is too far back. Um, I couldn't tell you if, exactly where third position is just by looking at the instrument. I can give you an idea, but as you guys know, uh, it's really important not to just be close when you play the violin, but to be exact, being that's fretless. So the way that I know where third position is, is not by look, not by visual, it's by feel. So feel can only happen though if I have a consistent uh, move each time. So the way I always tell students is to line up their thumb in the index, get into that habit of always being there, and then I've done this tens of thousands of times, so I know exactly how far to go. So that's how I can be consistent. So, hope that helps. All right, uh, so for so many of you guys that are just popping in, um, we're doing a giveaway at the very end of this class. It's probably gonna be in about uh, 10, 15 minutes here, or maybe a little less than that. Um, um, no, actually about 10, 15. And then um, anybody that comments on my adult violin learning post, uh, which is facebook.com slash groups slash adult violin learners. We have a really good group that are uh, on that page. But actually, we just reached 500 members today. Yay. And um, if you guys comment, I'm going to be choosing one random comment here in a little bit. And you guys will uh, have a chance to win a $250 bow. And it's just because I really appreciate you guys. And you guys are awesome. All right, so the next question, I would say this maybe is getting into more, uh, you know, semi-intermediate, a little higher. Michelle asked, how do we pick up speed with fiddling? So Michelle, basically the biggest thing is having to understand that playing fast is all related to finger efficiency. So if we pick fingers up as we put one down, so if I place a one down and my fingers pop up in the air, or if I'm relying on the whole hand to find notes, I'm gonna have a trouble playing fast. I can only play so fast. I can only do this so fast, right? But I can do this really fast, see? So a lot of you guys I know, because I see this all the time with students, are overpressing into the fingerboard. Overpressing causes a lot of problems with playing violin, a lot, okay? It causes fingers to pop up, like I said. It causes more tension in the hand to where it's harder to do vibrato, makes your hand more stiff. Uh, it makes it harder to shift, makes it harder to move because there's just more tension on the fingerboard. So this is a huge thing you guys could be working on to help improve your playing, is just be more careful about pressing down. Try to aim at the very edge of the finger, right before the nail. Uh, that's the hardest part of the skin that takes the least amount of downwards pressure to get the proper contact, okay? So if you guys are able to just really work on that, you can work on this with scales. So I'm just gonna work on just minimal pressure right now. Okay? And if you guys are doing this, watch my other fingers. <laughs> now if I'm this far away, Look how far I have to go to find my notes, okay? So it really just is also just a efficient thing. So if I run from here to way over there, it's gonna take me a really long time to get back, right? But if I just run here, and then I only have to go this far back. So it, a lot of it's just you guys are picking your fingers up too far. So hope that helps. All right, yeah, and that relates to fiddling, by the way, Michelle, because yeah, there's a lot of uh, pieces that take some fast fingers. All right, we have three questions left, and then I'll try to maybe answer a few from you guys that are posting right now. All right, Rhonda says, I joined a small volunteer orchestra. Since it has been over four decades since I played in my college orchestra as a freshman, what advice can you give concerning practicing in between rehearsals? Yeah, so I mean, anytime you join orchestras, there's always a lot of materials that have to be learned. Um, you know, but it really just comes down to um, you know, the amount of time you practice, but you don't want to sacrifice structure of practice. So I always recommend, no matter what, do your scales at the very beginning of your sessions, uh, work on your etudes, you know, which can also be working on intonation rhythm, potentially with your, um, you know, your orchestra music. And then the last third would be more just trying to get through the music, just thinking less about technique. 
So I wouldn't sacrifice your approach to practicing. Um, it's just a matter of practicing more, right? So if you have like a really big repertoire of music you have to learn in a week, you probably are going to want to practice a couple hours a day at least. Um, but I still recommend working on your scales, practicing hard with the, the fundamentals. So, all right. Uh, next question is from Ian Nichols. Uh, Ian asks, would would like to know some exercises to help out with transitioning between double stops as well as droning. Yeah, so uh, Ian, same sort of thing. I mean, if, if we lift fingers up way up in the air, if, we, if we're not efficient with our left hand, it makes it hard to play double stops. Um, you know, it's really good to practice thirds with uh, working on double stops. So for example, and you can do them separate. You can go. shift as well now, a lot of times uh, working on third fingers and first fingers are really good so like that and let's go to the E string so right there I'm doing four and two fourth finger on the A string second finger on the E string uh, doing threes and ones separate. Eventually, yeah, you can get them to where they're together. And doing octaves and stuff like that is also good. Good, and then with droning, um, same sort of thing. Just working on different combinations, separate, and then eventually together. So like, you know. And eventually. Like that, so really good. Awesome. Anything with scales. Uh, there's also a book that I highly recommend for this. Um, it's called Advanced Scales for Violinists by Barbara Baker. Uh, it's got a lot of different things for thirds, for even up to tenths, um, octaves, um, arpeggios. It's got all the scales that you can learn, three octaves. Uh, that's a really good resource, so I highly recommend that for you guys. I've been playing, say, over five years. Last we have, uh, Ladbrook asks, um, what about some things on improvisation? I quit jazz band because they were getting fed up and I wouldn't improvise on the spot and uh, let go of the sheet music. <laughs> so yeah, uh, improvisation is a totally different world. Uh, for some of you guys out there um, that don't know what that is even, it's basically, yeah, just uh, not actually reading the music. It's actually putting your own melodies into, say, a chord progression. So uh, the biggest thing with that is, you know, really trying just to understand, uh, you know, the different chord changes and sort of working up from, say, D to G. So I mean, if I have D and I have G, I'm sort of trying to create a melody in between there. So, you know, a simple one would be... Um, adding on but you're really focusing on those chord structures the D and the G um, that's sort of how I learned it um, there's a lot of things that I have on this concept uh, as a member on my violin tutor pro website uh, a lot of stuff related to playing fiddle uh, improvisation I have about 10 half hour or so videos on this um, there's a lot I can say on it so yeah check out violintutorpro.com for uh, some of those very good. So yeah, we're going to be giving away a um, beautiful Leandro bow worth $250 to one lucky uh, commenter, <laughs> so to speak. So this is the bow I'm giving away here. Uh, all you have to do is comment on my adult violin um, learning group. And I'm going to go over there here in a second and pick a random comment. And they're going to be the one that wins. We have a great group going there. I highly recommend you guys to join. Uh, it's a great way to stay accountable and get excited about playing violin and lots of great people in there. I've really enjoyed getting to know you guys. So, 
Great. Well, maybe I'll take a couple questions just from the audience, um, sort of scroll through some and see what I can answer. And then in about five minutes, we'll do the giveaway. All right. So see what I can find here. Adriana says, I've been playing for six months as well, and I know the key signature is mentioned, so I hope I'm close to ready to learn third position. Very good. Yes, definitely. Once you uh, learn some of those, you're ready to go. And uh, also, you know, obviously having the left hand uh, fundamentals is very, very important. So <laughs> Camille says, yay, party for reaching 500 members. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, great comments in here, by the way, guys. Appreciate it. A lot of just back and forth, you guys chatting and stuff. Lots of comments. Wow. I'm having trouble just finding a question. Just a lot of thanks and this or that. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. Julie says, do you have any advice for someone who would love to learn the violin but hates to read music? Great question. So, yeah, basically, um, you know, anybody that doesn't want to read music, uh, I've had that before. I've had some students that, like, they actually came to lessons and, you know, like, they would be totally turned off if we had to, you know, put our head into a piece of music. So if you're like that, um, you can definitely still get by and have a great, you know, time playing violin and fiddle. Uh, improvisation, obviously, is a way to go. Um, learning how to, you know, read charts, if you, you know, don't mind that. Um, you know, playing by ear. I, I have a lot of students that are able to do that. My recommendation for you guys, though, if you're in that boat, is still focus on the techniques. You know, if you don't work on the drills, if you don't work on, you know, scales, you can still do scales by ear. Um, you're going to have trouble progressing. You know, you don't want to be so much in one bucket. I find that with a lot of students. They sort of say, oh, I'm a play-by-ear person, and, and then they never work on scales or technique. They sort of put those two things into the boat of, like, you know, I read music. So that would be a mistake. I think you could be a really good player that never reads music, but you, to, to get there, you have to focus on some of those fundamentals and drills. I have some really good resources for that. Um, obviously, my YouTube channel, which is free. It's violintutorpro.com slash, sorry, youtube.com slash violintutorpro. Uh, my beginner playlist is really great. Uh, I teach you guys a lot. So um, yeah, I just recommend you guys to, you know, try to delve into as many different areas, even if you don't read music. So great question. All right. So I think this is going to be the time that I pick a winner. So here I am with my laptop and, um, I have questions on the screen here. So I'm going to sort of find the, uh, the place where I can find comments and also have uh, YouTube comments open. So some of you guys that are watching on YouTube, um, I'm going to pick either one on either side to sort of be random, have my finger going and just sort of poke. <laughs> so I'll do it that way. And yeah, good luck to you guys. So uh, this person's going to win a Leandro bow worth $250. Uh, it's a Pernambuco bow, which uh, makes it a lot easier to do uh, articulation, uh, playing off the string, um, just it brings out more of your instrument. So yeah, I hope whoever wins this will be excited on their, their new bow. So good luck to you all. I see a lot of good luck to everybody. everybody. All right, so I'm going to go to set up YouTube as well here. Hope you guys have some cool plans for the weekend. We're going um, to Chicago, I think, uh, for our anniversary, our three-year anniversary. So we're excited about that. All right. So we got that going. Good luck. I'm going to pick a winner here in just a moment. And, yeah, we, I just, I've just i really been loving the adult violin group. It's just been so many great conversations and people. Uh, we also have violin teachers that are in there that are helping. So um, a lot of good stuff. I mean, if you guys are interested in learning the violin and, and – uh, you know, I just want some good community. It's a great group. All right. I see Colleen Cooney just uh, posted. That's cool. I haven't heard from her in a while. All right. So I think I'm going to pick here in just a moment. Good luck, guys. All right, so there's 91 comments on the one side. All right, so I'm just setting it up. Just be one moment. All right, here we go. 
Good luck, guys. All right, here we go. The winner of the $250 Leandro Bow is, drum roll please, Teresa Lestander. Congratulations. You just won a $250 Leandro Violin Bow. There you go. So you can email me, michael at superiorviolins.com. And I will love to send you the bow. So congratulations. Uh, maybe you could tell us about yourself on, uh, on the adult learning page. And um, yeah, just uh, let us know if you're excited about it. Great, so I hope you guys enjoyed this class. I'll be trying to do more of these. Um, if you're on the adult violin learning page, I'll announce them as far as the times. Um, so yeah, a couple times a week maybe. That's sort of what I'm thinking right now. And if uh, if you guys post your questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So hope you guys like the, the organization of uh, beginner to more advanced. And um, hopefully you guys are going to get your violins out this weekend and practice as uh, practice makes perfect. Hope you guys have a good day. Hope you got some out of this class. Email me at michael at superior violins. Have a good day.